like to briefly describe that emotion? I feel like that I'm usually Sorry. <laughs> I thought that I'm usually a three, three point five on like a good day because it's something I do kind of because I feel like it's important. But sometimes I get very tired of always being the one to pull up the race car and having to do the work. What does that? Where do you like feel that? Um, I usually feel it like in my face because I get like very feel embarrassed. Yeah. I'll do it so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah. So, I put my notion of trepidation, which I'm not sure is actually the right way to describe it, but I, and I, I said three. Um, because basically, I have no <laughs> problem with talking to somebody about race and racism. I just am afraid that I'm going to say something wrong. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of what that's I'm a white person thing. Yeah, yeah, but it's also like regardless of whether I'm talking to another white person or somebody of color. Like right. I just I know that I don't know enough. Yeah, I I feel the same way. Yeah. Absolutely. I do so that there's some place between three point five and two. Um, and so for me, it's not trepidation. I could actually think that it's arrogance for me. But also knowing that underneath that, that whatever I'm going to say, someone's going to be wrong because I'm not showing the experience of the students in our class and what I'm going to talk about. Um, just real quick, like, um, just admitting the fact that you have that anxiety means that you're start, like you're in, or you're heading in the right direction. <laughs> I feel stressed about managing the emotions of everybody in the conversation. I worry about that too. Yeah. Um, so I think it's like a direct tie emotionally between like anger and boredom. <laughs> so like, Especially I get it, my white colleagues, you're scared you might say something wrong. Imagine being defined as wrong your whole life. Like, those are the scales we're working with y'all. But also, it's just like that's the entire history of the country is working out this problem. I mean, it's defined by it, literally. Um, why are we leaving the way? So, yeah. Uh, I also relate to um, being hesitant about talking about it after before. Um, I'm half white, half Asian, and I have experienced both racism a little bit like, on my Asian side. Also, sometimes people just call me white when it is convenient. Um, I raised four, four and a half, um, and my um, adjective I think would be responsible because teaching in a predominantly white school, um, we have more faculty of color now than when Darcy Crescent was a student of mine, but still having um, somebody check the kids and say, whoa, ouch, or something like that to you pause whatever conversation is to have a discussion about you know microaggression or anything that's insensitive um i feel responsible addressing yeah I just, one little quick thing like, i also feel um responsible i teach in a very unique school uh public school at the south side philadelphia um 60 of the kids are black um, about 30% are white, and we have a mix of other, many other um, ethnicities and races. Um, but my classes don't match the demographics of the school. Um, and I feel like I'm failing all the time in that way. Um, 
So I could feel that bit responsible. Um, I think I didn't think about not wanting to hurt or add to trauma. Um, I grew up in a black neighborhood in the very part of the years when I was one of the only white people. I carry around now the community trauma. I was born by that, but especially about my trauma, there are very different outcomes for me. Last one. So I, uh, I rank myself as a two, uh, and the, the one word to describe it is actually uh, ashamed. <laughs> it's ashamed that I'm very uncomfortable thinking about race. Where, where do you feel that? Yeah, I feel it in my gut. Anyone else relate to that feeling? I, I, I say this because um, not because of practice yoga or anything. <laughs> uh, Dr. Stevenson, um, who's a head and specialized in this, he said it's really good to locate these feelings in your body. Um, because if you don't locate them in your body, they sort of will live in your head. And you'll never, like, if you're like physically uncomfortable, <laughs> you'll never be comfortable. Not that you'll ever be totally comfortable, but. Um, you want to sort of relax into that discomfort. Okay, uh, let's, let's move on. We did this part. Okay, uh, normally uh, in past conferences, we'll, we talk a bit more about this. Just to give you a little background, um, usually we, uh, when we do, these, do this, we have um, a trained psychologist or psychiatrist come and uh, we'll intro this session and we'll uh, talk about how to address one bias. And then um, a lot of people that go to that one also come to the second session, so we usually do a little bit of a debriefing on that. Um, but for, for time's sake, we're going to do a little bit of Okay, and so as I mentioned earlier, this is an adaptation from uh, um, the 10 ways to, to uh, analyze children's literature. Okay. Um, so, essential question, how do we evaluate text and help students detect racism in literature? So this is the one that's good. I think it's, I'm a big fan of like explicit instruction with your students, and administrators will be like, nice job, put the essential question on the board. <laughs> okay. And then here are the objectives. Uh, I don't always put up the, I would not put that on the board for the students. I might put the abbreviated version of um, but students will use these guidelines to help them evaluate text critically and protect racism. And this is the ability of racial competency. Part. So, um, you know how we talk about our feelings and, and anxieties, perhaps? Well, this is the same exact thing we do with these students, right? Um, and I start from day one, I'm sure a lot of you do this. Um, so, well, like, who am I? You can see me with a really bad haircut, a little, bit, <laughs> a little bit of a tail going on there, um, you know. But and the uh, students get freaked out that this must have been you know, me from when I had hair. Okay. Is that one more? Yes. No. I don't know. Okay. okay. Thanks. Um, and so we go like this, and then they think it's funny that you know I show them a little bit of pictures of me as a kid, you know, with my dad, my brother and sister, I'm the middle one on the right. Okay. Um, then I show them where I am now. Um, my kids, my wife. And then I've been an actor, I've been in plays. I always think this one, hey, this one always gets a lot of laughs. Okay, and then I, I go right here, first day, day one. Um, this also gets a lot of laughs, but it also sends a message to a lot of my kids. That it's, it's, um, so I do have um, a significant amount of non binary and trans kids in classes. Um, so it's great. Okay, and then I started asking them who they are, right? 
and I'm sure a lot of you do this. I think you should do this at every level, collegiate or middle school or high school. Get to know your students, the more you invest in them, the more they will invest in you. Um, and so this is my basic question here with my middle schoolers. Okay, it evolves because I know we get up to those six years, right? Um, but they really appreciate this. And, um, I can leverage a lot of this information in the things that we do in class. Especially the uh, outside interest thing, when you can leverage their sort of strengths outside of class in class, they, they love it, they like it. Okay, and then I do the, we do the same exact thing, same place, build norms, sample guidelines, I promise this is all in Google Slides. And then I'm pretty explicit here. Uh, with like um, with my eighth graders, especially, we start with this. Students are exposed to racist attitudes. Okay, these attitudes expressed repeatedly in books and other media gradually distort perceptions until stereotypes and myths about people of color are accepted as reality. Once these perceptions are normalized, it is difficult to convince students and adults to question society's <coughs> attitudes. But if students can learn to detect racism in the literature, they can transfer that skill to other areas. And then these guidelines are going to help with this. Okay. Um, there's uh, this uh, website. Okay. This is how I unpack the guidelines and present them in class, but you can use them however you like if it's appropriate for you. Um, it can be a little scary to talk so explicitly uh, with your students about this. I do suggest that you talk to your colleagues, talk to um, people outside of your school um, before you just jump in. Like, I still make mistakes with students. I make them all the time. But um, it's good to practice with adults too who give you feedback that, uh, in an honest and trustful way. Um, and I do spread this, uh, these activities over the year. Okay, so we're starting with number two, right? Um, we start right at the beginning of the book. Uh, check for loaded words. A uh, word is loaded when it has insulting overtones. Examples of adjectives, usually racist, are savage, primitive, um, conniving, lazy, superstitious, treacherous, wily, crafty, inscrutable, that's all We're going to look at an example um, that has lazy. Okay, anyone here use Cambridge? A lot of you are forced to use textbooks, right? Um, when I first started, I was like, oh, yeah, let's get there. Like, what textbooks do you want to use? I was like, ah, oh, Cambridge, because that's what everyone recommended to me. And uh, now I've been stuck with it. I'm like, please, can we switch textbooks up? Like, please. No, okay. Um, and so this is where they, uh, this is right where the second book starts. Um, and so I'm doing the best I can with what I have. And then we talk about who these part people are, right? And, um, what we're going to have on this conversation. Okay, who are all these people? These are the model sentences that are <coughs> matter and the themes for the year. Okay, and then we, we say, who has the power? Right, and then based on these intro images, and the kids usually do some, end up doing something like this. Okay, um, I do, I don't know if anyone went to um, Danny Bosick's yesterday, but the journal idea I think is really fabulous. Um, I have a lot of kids who lose everything, uh, so I use the journals, um, and it's a good thing to in class. Also, it's some of these are too. But um, they can do this individually, they can do this in groups, um, but they'll explain why they think, um, what is the hierarchy, and they have to justify it. Okay? And you can see where the slaves are, right? Uh, the last six. Okay, and then the last description is the author's description of the enslaved Britons accurate. Can the survey be economic? Students will journal on this and then we'll discuss, and they sort of struggle with this. Okay, they'll say, well, yeah, sure, anyone can be lazy. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Yes? Is it lazy to be forced to work and not have to keep working in that one? That doesn't seem lazy. That seems like you're trying to push against some 
outside influence. Do we agree on this, or do it's a, we're not going to condemn anyone right now? Now we're like we're, we're talking about it. yeah. Um, I think what so lazy in the context of saying serve a Italian labyrinth and lazy in their work, which is forced work. A labor um, that's what tells me that it's that, it, that they can't be because it lazy implies some sort of lack of willpower, which implies the existence of free will. Yeah, yeah, yes. I feel like they care about the Italian capacity in the same sentence because, like, can you? And tired, like they feel like they are too not for me at least. They feel kind of contradictory. Right? Lazy applies, like in many contexts. Oh, you just don't want to do it. Whereas tired applies, oh, like you physically can't. Do it. can't. Right. Yes, uh, I actually want to go through kind of a separate strain of. I mean, laziness. I mean, does, is that is this a moral judgment? Or is this just an evaluation of productivity in a society that intensely values productivity? I was feeling just as a slave. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I haven't had a career get quite there yet, but yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yes, of the implications of there, honestly, because it's semi laborant, but there's nothing about like. It's just like so matter of fact that it's just kind of like, well, that's what, that's what they did. Yeah. Like, it, it, it doesn't feel like there's really any sort of, it seems to erase the compulsion. Yeah. It's like that. <laughs> Sorry. True. Yeah. Yes. But then when you get to know Sally, it's a nice explanation of what you're doing. Once you get to know Sally, it's a like, cool one. Oh, yeah, it's so fascinating. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm thinking, actually, from a spoken about a perspective, but like Labrador, I think I'm just trying to use a cognate, but Labrador, we talk about like more or febre. So Labrador is really kind of like way down in the way it's more like our sense of like emotional labor or like pain. Let's do it. Okay. So we all agree that you really can't be a slave and be lazy without a man. Yes, we understand that. Yes. I just think it's interesting that it says they're tired and they don't want to work, but lazy seems like a personality trait and not an emotion. So the authors could have chosen to say they're angry or upset or giving them a feeling, but instead they're giving them a personality trait. Right. And that's the other thing, right? Are we, is ignoring vocalized, I mean, this is totally different what you said. Um, is is acknowledged vocalized through the author's construction the textbook, or is it vocalized through Salwes and his cohort, right? Yeah. So these are the model sentences. So this is the textbook. Right. No, but I mean, like yeah. this. So also, from that, yeah. So I would say that therefore, if it's just the textbook, then yeah. Right. We'll, we'll, we're going to get that issue. Except that this whole section. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, do you, do you ask me? Oh, like uh, you want to say something? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, quickly. I just quickly. think it's implicitly through the enslaver's point of view in the textbook, does it? Right? Like, it is vocalized through Salius, but yeah. it's presented as. No, I mean, I think it's vocalized through the authors of the textbook, I'm saying. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, if we look at number. If you look at Ali's original or mine. As an author perspective. So, this book was written in the 1970s, and these kinds of perspectives were very common, um, and they haven't changed. Um, it's on its fifth edition, and they, they're like, well, it costs six million dollars to change these models. This is what the publisher called it. Yeah. But the thing is, like, really, just removing the word ignavi here. You don't have to change the idea of a model sentence or anything like that. Yeah. The enslaved people are tired, they don't want to work. Right. Like no. we removed a lot Absolutely. of the point. Absolutely. But let, let's let's keep yeah. going. Yes. Okay. Um, so then I have the uh, the students map all the different places from where the uh, where the um, enslaved people come from. Okay. Um, this sets a stage for some later 
questions that are issues that we're going to deal with, like imperialism, power, status, empire. Another question. Yes. Um, if you go to the introduction of the model sentences, um, here. Those of you who do teach Cambridge, when kids would see a picture of Volubilis, would they react to him? Oh, yeah. Um, my students used to habitually react to his picture um, until the trend of microaggressions or discussion of microaggressions came around. And they've stopped talking about mm. the way he looks. Because I used to go, ugh, how does he, why does he look like that? And then now I don't hear that yeah. right away. So I haven't heard that as much. I mean, I have um, a few Egyptian kids in my class, um, and they always like to talk about it and break down to the students. So, um, yeah. Bring you. All right, um, and so I do literally the same thing I do with you. I do with you. I do with students. They can handle it. Middle schoolers can handle this. Okay. We do this. We talk about where it's in your body. They have an easier time than um, adults do. It's fine. Okay. Um, so this is where I tell students that it's important to discuss different things as a class, the community, your mind, and talk about racism. So racism will never feel comfortable for all people. But your goal as a teacher is to create a classroom and what we know. Okay? But it's important to say. Okay, then um, we continue um, with some of their real world examples, right? Like they, they both in school and out of school, students are exposed to racist ideas. And I ask them, this is true or false. Okay. And they all you know, like they all show all their whiteboards, right? And then and they get in the we uh, they think journal and parent share. Uh, you may list an example of your, from your own experience or from social media, movies, TV, books. Now this next slide is actually from a student last year who like was so upset, and she showed me. Yeah, I'll let that tell you. Yeah, I remember this. I did not bring this up in class. The student brought from our conversations brought this to us. Reactions. Observations. I mean, Disney's portrayal of women in these in movies and journals has been problematic for a really long time. Yes. And, I, and my first reaction is always like, how could they make something that was problematic to begin with to make it more problematic? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, really look at it. Did you learn the first time around when you know some of this was criticized? No, obviously yeah. not. Um, so it was uh, an eighth grader or seventh grader came to me in tears about this um, and said Tiana was like her moment of validation and she felt so betrayed when Disney did this. Right? What did we notice? What, what did they do? Yeah. Uh, well, like I still don't see Robert on the internet, so I need to get on it. Uh, just from like, I mean, I'm familiar with both, but people I'll speak to Tiana, uh, Fountain was really the first one for me. Her hair texture is very different from the way it was originally. Her nose is slightly not as broad. Uh, she was also drinking a quasi Disney frappuccino thing when I was just like, come on, she like built her own restaurant, did these things. But furthermore, both of these characters like went on through went through their own arcs, um, have received a lot of critique um, about their portrayal. Uh, one, co promise because of history, uh, not because it was in that phase where uh, Disney only made people color characters as animals. She was a frog for most of that movie. Um, so yeah, there was a potential to do more with these characters. Um, 
And I'm assuming I've seen Ralph Bruce on the internet, but I hear it just kind of turned into a group of Avengers kind of thing. So. Yes. Um, I'm just saying, I don't know whether it's the, like, the um, shading of, like, the background. I want to say it's just shading of the background, but knowing Disney, it's not. But they made Tiana and Pocahontas look lighter than yeah. they definitely were before. And particularly, Tiana's nose is now not, does not resemble a wide nose at all. Right. Like, at all, at all. It's like this small. Right. Yes. They also like both their hair, which I feel like that can't be the background. Um, and I don't know if this really has place in this context, but like people are lightening their hair 24 7. I see it in every component of my life, and it has like very intense repercussions. Um, and these are both like very clearly lightened, um, and they want to Right. And the why do I do this? Because representation matters, right? And so I'm trying to get them to see that images in their world and in school matter. They have influence. And to be honest, a lot of the white kids don't see it at first. Right? Some do. Some don't. Um, yeah. It's interesting also, they, they like, Again, so someone said, you know, how could they have made it worse? They also, they have technology that's supposed to be, you know, 3D animation, quote, more realistic. You can think about the history of photography and coloring, uh, things like black and white, that kind of thing. But they had the power to use a tool to make things, you know, more representative and more, quote, realistic, and they did this. Right. Okay. Um, and then we ask the question, does it matter that they changed? It moves the conversation. Okay, and so my eighth grade students are already familiar with uh, the, the top three concepts. Okay, we've talked about them, we've come to common definitions because it's really important that you're all working from the same reference points. Uh, so it's really important to define your terms um, and get, and we, you know, we'll brainstorm them, we'll work through it, it takes a long time. We might get one a week that we revisit and edit, okay? Um, but we get that. Um, and then some new terms that are introduced in the eighth grade class is representation, racism, overt, and covert. Um, they struggle a bit with overt and covert, um, but we, 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 we get it, we work it out. Okay, so this is really important, and if they have it in their journals, so we use them as reference points. Okay, so when we look at the literature, then they can go back and say, huh, ah, okay, in line three, this is an example of covert racism or overt racism. Okay. Yes. This is kind of like a general question. It's yep. about your particular school. Yeah. Are your students familiar with all of these things because this is something that your school has promoted as they grow, or is it something that there are just a few teachers doing? Or a few, few teachers are doing, and our district has been committed to, uh, committed over two years of professional development days, and only a handful <laughs> really integrated these trainings into their teaching. So they're familiar, but we, not many of them can produce that mission. Okay. Um, oh, does anyone want to talk about any of these? If you want me to offer, yes. Can we talk about normalized perceptions just because that's one I have heard you put that one Okay, would anyone care to define normalized perceptions? What do you think it means? What do people think it means? I guess it's kind of like, I mean, in so far as I understand it, I think it's kind of like the previous slides um, making those two characters look wider. Anyone want to add anything to that? Yes. That's a new phrase for me too. I just want to make sure I understand. So normalized perceptions is like taking a thing and moving it closer to the norm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To the well, yeah. To the new norm. <coughs> yes. I was wondering if normalized perceptions is what you sort of 
referring to when you mentioned that a lot of white kids don't notice the lack of diverse game representation? Yes. Exactly. Thank you. I didn't even really that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So now uh, we do this one. Together, and as promised, we're going to split up in a few minutes. Um, then, when we get to the unit on Alexander, uh, I'm just going to use this because it's the most concise example. Okay, so uh, number one is check the illustrations. Okay, um, look for stereotypes which usually have derogatory implications and deal with first. Um, look for descriptions, depictions, or labels that demean stereotype or patronize characters because of their race. Look for tokenisms. You might have to define that. Look for active doers. Uh, do the illustrations depict non-whites in subservient and passive roles, or in leadership and action roles? What do you all see here? Yeah, be, you can, you can you raise a hand, or you can just say yes. Um, the, the minority character is very clearly a passive role. Yes. And the possible sort of paternalism, given the weird smug look on the one guy's face. Yes. The two white men are literally looking down at him. <laughs> yes. And definitively white men, right? Roman, we'll talk about clothes, but Romans are depicted as definitively white characters. Yes? No. Okay. Yes. And I even uh, just look it back and um, into the talk that just happened right before this one. Um, but it seems like uh, he's being portrayed in a more subservient or feminized uh, pose with his hands. So it's not a good look as well. Any other observations? It's also like the two white women, like they kind of look like the statues, you know, decolored statues that we have there, and then. Um, so they're kind of an archetype and the the boys as well, but the archetype is very has different kind of implications. Yep. Any other observations? What about physical characters? Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say that hand on the shoulder is uh what I was saying for all of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Expression of dominance. Yes. The gaze. Where are the gazes? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, like the fact that they're so dominant, he seems to be like not looking at anything. We talk about that all the way up through my classes. Yeah. I think if we were to remove the pigment of the color from this illustration, we would still be able to identify the shorter person as a person of color because their, their facial features and hair are so like dramatically caricaturized for this style of drawing. Right. The fact that he's physically smaller and also really important. Right. Now let's look at the words that go this one. This is just an illustration. Alright, so Barbellus has many slaves, and then students will often, I do this, will say, enslaved people. Um, I, none, and this is in the voice of uh, Quintus, the, uh, the white Roman on the left. Uh, it is, it is uh, proper for you to have an Egyptian slave, said Barbilis. Among the slaves of Barbilis, there was an Egyptian boy. Barbilis, a kind man, gave the boy, this boy, to me. In a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most popular textbook in America and okay. in England. I, I'll just tell you this when I share these kind of insights on Facebook or whatever, people come at me hard. Hard. Oh. Oh. Defending this. I mean, I had people tell me I don't understand the, the subtlety. <laughs> of the text. <laughs> the nuance of the characters. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I teach in a predominantly Arab school, and 
right? Students often tend to say to Yes. If I could counter that one. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, black men of every age in this country were called boy for a long time. And a lot of things with black can use about reclaiming words uh, that were used derogatorily against them and creating our own context around them. Um, so I think boy is a loaded term. Um, I think your students might know that too. Can we go with? Think, let's think about it for a bit. Yeah. Um, yes. What just strikes me just looking at the word placement here is how you have who are near very close to connect to each other and who are is defined by their race and who here and the white man is defined by the community connection. Just like that to me is what I think that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I'm grammatically speaking, but Barbell is weird, uh, Ben Ignos. Weird is unnecessary um, for clarifying who is betting this in sentence. And, and so it's very much reading that. This, yeah, this is a show that runs in our tradition. Again, again, yeah, the kind of slave owner. Um, yeah. I just wanted to, because you mentioned the pushback that you got on these other places, I wanted to bring in the, like, the difference between put posts this kind of thing in like a live teacher Facebook group versus like, it's literally in the ethics standards of social studies teachers that you can't teach things this way you know, exactly. and so and, and Danny Boston is working on that. But um, yeah, just to, to highlight if I could just vast chasm of like what is considered funny, acceptable, any of this stuff. Yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We should do a workshop. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, yes, yeah, oh. Oh, okay. All right, so this is, this, this is only the tip. Um, oh yeah, okay. so let's let's see what else. Um, all right, now this is where I'm going to ask all of you if you can work by yourself or with uh, small groups of two or three. Uh, you may get up. I'm going to give you like ten minutes, and you're going to look at the number three and number four for yourselves. Okay, you're going to. I gave you the story to Maltus. Yes. Okay. okay. I gave you the English. And I need you um, two other, like this worksheet, and you can fill it out as you go with your graduations. Um, please write the line numbers, the first and the last word of your citation, and then any observations you have for those lines. But this is, because we're developing how to think critically as well, right? That's the, um, the skill that we're teaching the students as well. And so racial confidence is, is looking at literature critics. So what you're going to do is uh, check the storyline. How are problems presented, conceived, and resolved? As the students consider the people of color are considered to be the problem. Students should examine if the oppression faced by the people of color are related to social and please listen to this one. Social injustice and whether the story encourages passive acceptance or active resistance to this oppression. Then, also for this check the storyline, who has the power? Here, ask the students to identify positions of power and status, essentially who makes decisions. Background on Roman imperialism and characters, uh, place of origin in the next conversation. And then number four, note the heroes. Who are the heroes? Ask the students whose interest is a particular hero serving. Okay, please go. Ten minutes, don't worry if you don't get through the whole thing. Um, but if you want to talk to people, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Like ten minutes.
tumultuous ground. Are we still alive? Yes. Uh, we're told the the poor the boy is victims. He's made told that he's anxious because of the other victim, and that they're it's because they're erotic and the the other tuberculosis. Yeah. So it's sort of disinfected. They're trying to make it more like a shame or something. Right. Yes. Yeah. They're angry. Why are they angry? No one can say, right? But I mean, like, in reality, I might have an idea of what the story doesn't say. But also, if, the, if he's fleeing both the Greeks and the Egyptians, the Egyptians are the only one characterized as angry and hostile and violent. Right. Well, the and, Greeks are really that elevated status. Yeah. And, like, so, in terms of like um, status, there's definitely a hierarchy in the story. Right. It's clear where the Egyptians fall at right. the bottom. Yes. Um, it's also like a very, uh, I mean, they're in Alexandria too. So it's like there are angry locals. Uh, it's definitely <laughs> very yeah. yeah, and also like because we don't know they're angry, there's sort of that implicit notion that Egyptians are just inherently angry. It's just mm. their nature. The first time there's any any challenge or any difficulty, it's actually attributed to in line eight, multi stairway, right? Here we have to with Koreba. Difficulty about movies where we have some of our I think that's the first descriptor of what's you know what's the travel is the problem. Yeah. Yeah, and then what about what happens with that was Quintus's response when the nameless Egyptian boy who's enslaved Suggest we need to get out of here, right? Yeah. No, I got it. I know better. I, I know better. So, something we were discussing also, though, is there are two different problems in the text that are that keep intersecting. One is, you know, Roman imperialism, you know, Quintus being like, I'm Roman, I know best, slave, right, regardless of your ethnicity. And then the other is problems in the way the textbook is presented. Yeah, I would say regardless of this ethnicity. Maybe. Maybe. No. no. But I get I get your point. No. Um, I think the ethnicity is a major factor. That he is like we go back to the picture, he's the dominant. Well, right. Yeah. Right. And this boy who is by David, which as you know, is depicted as a young black boy who's misled. Yeah. Right? I agree. Uh, what, what, yes, we'll go on to. Um, I was going to say that like, what is so interesting and kind of horrifying in this text is that this boy is described so differently. Like, you feel that he is a hero because he is not acting Egyptian. Like, he is acting. I can tell you right now, like in all my class, like when we first read this, the white kids are like, yeah, he was the hero. He's the hero. And I, I, um, should we go on to the next one to talk about this part, right? Um, are you familiar with the uh, magical Negro trope? Yes. Okay. Um, essentially, the boy dies at the service of his master. Right, and he should be loud into that. Um, and so now we'll go back to the normalized perceptions <laughs> that, you know, um, the disenfranchised should be serving the interests of those in power. And um, if these are the stories that we're teaching our children. What are we doing? <laughs> Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, this, uh, more kind of, I guess, end logical point, but then, so we have um, the unnamed Egyptian boy, um, Cerberus, Cerberus Queen Maid who came on. So I was noticing that, like, in a lot of in India, uh, descriptions of like, where you see mushroom person tends to have, like, uh, industries, dukes, or something like that. Dukes is a general, is a, is a person in a role. Whereas here, it's the slave, the enslaved person is. Um, is like if he, they usually talk about it in the modern generation and took it in terms of like you know animals that kind of thing. That's what they're Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
also like a small point before getting to this loyal QR slave thing. Um, just the femini at Anquilai were grouped together um, whenever the slave girls were mentioned. And I wonder if there's like a gendered aspect to this as well. Like the, the if there was in the Puer is not going to be talked about in the same breath as the weird, but the Fenai <coughs> aren't, they're just uh, in more as well. Yes. <laughs> Like, I mean, um, I haven't written one out, but I'm hoping to, with Ali's permission, to adjust it for a sentence as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we are pretty much out of time, um, but what we do at, when we do this in class is we check in again. Where are you now on this event? Okay. Um, I hope you're feeling uncomfortable, maybe a little angry, but maybe a little bit more motivated. Um, and help our students become more sensitive readers, critical thinkers. Um, um, so, I think it's just really important to continue these conversations. Uh, if you want to ever speak to me or some of our Danielle, Prosik, or my friend, uh, my other colleague Ian, um, we're always happy to talk. We are not, I don't feel like I'm an expert, I'm just I'm one of you. And right? we're in this together. Um, we're all in different places. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you.